It is a pleasure to have you in the audience tonight to worship the Lord with us, to study from his word. Sister Norma, Sister Norma Bowman is such a good preacher's wife, as you all know. Last night, shortly after the service, she come up and she was so complimentary and encouraging about the lesson and and then she she tugged on my coat to straighten it out <laughs> and I said was it like that the whole lesson and she reluctantly and with pain in her face said yes <laughs> But I could see the compassion while she told you the truth. I could see what a good quality that is. And tonight she approved of my outfit. So between her help with that, Shane's chauffeur and me, uh, I should survive the week. And you all have done a lot of acts of kindness too. And, some, and I'm not even sure who did it. For example few of us were eating together today at a Mexican restaurant and we called the waiter over for the bill and some one of you recognized us and had paid it already. Thank you so much for the kind of the kindness that you have shown and I do appreciate so much Tim leading that song. He's done such a good job this week and I love that simple song to tell me the story of Jesus. And tonight, that's what I'm going to try to do, to tell the story of his death and resurrection. If this sermon does not go well, that is my fault. If it does go well, I deserve no credit. For it is his story that we are telling. I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 26. We will be following Matthew's account most closely. But we will incorporate all of the Gospels at some point. In Matthew 26, verses 6 through 13... A woman sells perfume for a very expensive amount, 300 denarii, and, and uses it to anoint Jesus. The disciples criticize this. To some degree, we understand every biblical account by what comes before it and what comes after it. The contrast between what the woman did in verses 6 through 13 and what Judas did in verses 14 through 16 is stark. She is willing to give generously of herself to Jesus while he, on the other hand, betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus sends Peter and John to, uh, to, uh, pre to prepare for the Passover in verses 17 through 19. But beginning in verse 20, as Jesus is eating with the disciples at the Passover, he says, truly one of you will betray me. And all the disciples began to ask, is it I, Lord? And even Judas asked. And uh, Jesus uh, says, you have said it yourself. But he says, woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for him had he never been born. And Jesus takes the bread. He takes the bread. He breaks it and gives thanks. He says, take, eat. This is my body. And then takes the cup and says, drink from it, all of it, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for you for remission of sins. And I say to you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine until I drink it new in my Father's kingdom. And singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, it was traditional at the Passover service for the Jewish people to sing Psalms 113 and 114 before the Passover meal. And Psalms 115 to 118 after the Passover meal. 
Those were the Egyptian Hillel. They remembered deliverance from Egyptian bondage. I think it does us good to look at those Psalms and study those Psalms with an eye backwards as to how they would have informed these people about the experiences in Egypt, but also look with an eye forward to what this tells us about the cross of Christ. Psalm 113 through 118, study it through that perspective sometimes. But Jesus tells his disciples in verse 31, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Peter is the most vocal. And Peter says, even though all may fall away, I will never fall away. And and Jesus says, truly, you will betray me three times before the cock crows. Peter was adamant, even if I die with you, I will not deny you. But all the disciples were adamant and they said they would be faithful. There are some songs that I shudder to sing. I'm reluctant to sing, not because they don't have good ideas, but because I wonder if I really live up to them. For example, I'll be a friend to Jesus. Within the halls of Pilate, he stood without a friend, but I will be a friend. Do I always live up to that? His closest disciples didn't. And Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. He brings Peter, James, and John to a place that's closer to him. And the text reflects great emotion. He tells his disciples in verse 38, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he goes and prays, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, Hebrews 5 verse 7 talks about a time that Jesus was praying with strong crying and tears. I take it to be this very time. Luke 22 tells us the sweat fell as great drops of blood. Does that mean there were simply huge beads of perspiration? Or does this mean that he was actually sweating blood as people have been known to do in extreme times of stress? I, I don't know, but it's a very strong stressful moment and he says my father if it is possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done and while Jesus is praying this prayer he goes back to his disciples who vowed such loyalty moments ago and they're all asleep Simon could you not watch with me the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak arise and pray Jesus will go and pray three times and three times come back and find the disciples sleeping. And then Judas arrives with a great number in verse 47. Notice how Judas is described. It says, Judas, one of the twelve. He was described the same way in verse 14. He is one of the twelve. It's not that we've never been introduced to Judas before. We've seen him since Matthew chapter 10. But, but this underlines the treachery of what Judas is doing. That it's one of these who has eaten bread with Jesus, who has lifted up his heel against me in the language of Psalm 41, 9 and John 13, verse 18. And the text tells us that this great multitude comes from the chief priests and the elders and they come with swords and clubs. And the Bible tells us that Judas approaches Jesus and kisses him and he says, are you going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? The disciples ask, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? But they don't wait for an answer. And Peter draws his sword and cuts off the right ear of Malchus. Now we read the names in various Gospels. We read it's the right ear in Luke 22. They read the name Malchus in John 18. But, but Jesus says stop and he heals Malchus' ear. Now I want you to think about that. If you had come to arrest this man as a wrongdoer and you were part of this company coming to arrest him and you lose your ear, you see someone who does this and Jesus heals it? 
Wouldn't you think twice about what you're doing? But Jesus told his disciples, stop. Put up your sword. Those that live by the sword will perish by the sword. Don't you know that I can pray to my Father and he would send more than 12 legions of angels? We see he could have called 10,000 angels. 12 legions would have been a great number more than that. But the point is, Jesus Christ did not go to the cross out of weakness. Jesus Christ went to the cross in spite of strength. He chides his arresters. Have you come out against me with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would a robber? Every day I was with you teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. There are several stages of the trial of Jesus. Jesus is arrested by Jewish authorities, the chief priests and the elders. As he is arrested before Jewish authorities, he's going to stand trial before Jewish officials. John 18, and only John 18, records Jesus' trial before Annas. Annas had been high priest officially from 6 to 15 AD. But because it was supposed to be a lifetime appointment, some of the Jews still regarded him as the official high priest. In the first century, he would have five sons and a son-in-law who would serve in the position of a high priest. In this trial, Jesus is slapped across the face But we don't read much of this trial. Jesus is taken to stand trial before Caiaphas or Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. This is a trial that is discussed more extensively in the Synoptic Gospels. The Bible tells us that this was an injustice from the very beginning. We have all seen injustices. We have seen cases where guilty people were let go free And we have seen cases where innocent people were convicted wrongly. But there has never been a miscarriage of justice like this miscarriage of justice. But notice before the trial starts, they have already decided that the verdict is guilty and the sentence will be death. They are simply looking for a charge to pin on Jesus. And notice in verse 59, the Bible says the chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward. It was false testimony from false witnesses. What other kind of testimony and witnesses can you have against this one who said, which of you accuses me of sin? But finally one stated, I heard him say, I am able to destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. Now Mark 14 tells us around verse 58 that not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. It wasn't consistent. Now if you look at the quotation really closely, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said destroy this temple in John 2. He was not going to do the work of destruction. They were He was going to do the work of rebuilding. He was going to do the work of resurrection. But they accuse him of threatening to destroy the temple. I am going to destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. The high priest says, do you not make any answer? Do you see how many things they accuse you of? And he asked him, I adjure you by the living God. You tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on clouds of heaven. 
Now, if you look at verse 64, and you may have this in your cross-references in your Bible, the Son of Man coming in the clouds is a reference to Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. The reference to being at the right hand of power or the right hand of God is from Psalm 110, verse 1. Now, again, I would encourage you to look at those Old Testament passages through the lens of Jesus quoting them at this point. In those passages, Psalm 110 and Daniel 7, both of them speak of God being victorious and God defeating his foes. Though there would be difficulties and conflicts and suffering, they show God being triumphant. And Jesus quotes these passages, triumphant passages, in the midst of what looks like a great defeat. After Jesus says this, the high priest tore his robes and says he is blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have heard the blasphemy. And they spat in his face and they slapped him with their hands. Prophesy to us, you Christ, who hit you? And they said, he is deserving of death. They convict him of blasphemy. And yet, Luke 22, 63 through 65 shows they were the ones guilty of blasphemy at this moment. But the picture between Jesus making this confession of who he is before the most important people and the greatest authorities in the land is contrasted with Peter who is going to deny him. And notice in verse 69, the text tells us Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl, a servant girl, not only is Peter denying Jesus, he's denying him before someone who doesn't have any political clout, any political power. He is unwilling to admit to anyone at this moment that he is his disciple. While Jesus is standing before the most powerful people in the land and claiming, I am the Christ. But Peter denies him. Peter denies him. A little later, someone else, didn't I see you with him in the garden? And then, surely you're one of them. For even the way you speak gives you away. And each time he becomes more and more adamant in his denial, saying, I do not know the man, even calling down curses upon himself. May God do so to me and more also if I even know this Jesus of Nazareth. And I don't know how all this was configured. But Jesus turns at that moment and looks at Peter and the cock crows. And he remembers the words of Jesus. And he goes out and he weeps bitterly. The disciples do not appear in a very good light in Matthew 26. But friend, they're representative of you and me. And I would say in principle, we have all at some point done this same thing. And he is left alone in that sense without human comfort to bear our sins. It may have been illegal for the Sanhedrin to try a case at night. Acts 4 verses 4. 4 through 6 may be internal evidence from the New Testament that shows that. And so they have to have an official hearing before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin the next morning to uh, formally convict Jesus of charges. But there seem to be these three stages of the Jewish trial of Jesus. And Jesus has been charged with blasphemy. He has been charged with blasphemy. And again, he has been sentenced to death. But 
the Jews do not have the power of capital punishment. And this is going to lead to the Roman trial of Jesus. Now, a couple of things. The passage in John 18 verse 31 says the Jews did not have the power of capital punishment. Acts 18 verses 12 through 15 is on Paul's second missionary journey. And he is in Corinth. And he is dragged before the judgment seat of Gallio. And the Jews say, this man, speaking of Paul, encourages men to worship God contrary to the law. And Paul is about to speak on his own behalf. And Gallio says, oh Jews, if this were a matter of crime or of real wrongdoing, we'd be willing to put up with you. But if this is about questions, if this is about names of your own law, you look after this yourself. We are not willing to be the judge of these matters. Now, what we learn from those two passages is, first of all, the Jews have to go through the Romans in order to get a capital verdict against Jesus. But also, the Romans do not care about what the Jews consider as blasphemy. So what they have to do is they have to switch the charges against Jesus. And you see this uh, in Luke 23, Luke 23 in verse 2 in particular. They began to accuse him saying, we have found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. Just that week, they tried to get him to say it and he didn't. He said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But they were saying he's, he's doing something he's not. They're saying he's a king in competition to Caesar. They eventually... They, they're accusing Jesus of treason and being a dangerous person politically. It doesn't take Pilate very long before he recognizes that Jesus is innocent. Doesn't take very long. He says, I find no guilt in him. They began accusing him more vehemently. He says, he stirred up the people ever since Galilee. And Pilate said, Galilee? And Herod is in town during this time. And he sees a way he can get out of this. Maybe he can just send Jesus to Herod. And Herod will deal with this. And he won't have to make a decision. Now this trial before Herod is only recorded in Luke. It's not recorded in the other Gospels. But in Luke 23, the Bible tells us Herod had wanted to see Jesus for a long time. Because he'd wanted to see him do some kind of miracle. But as he questions Jesus, Jesus makes no answer. And eventually, Pilate, Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate. Pilate takes this... As an acknowledgement that Herod found no fault in Jesus. That's stated in Luke 23 verses 14 and 15. Neither I nor Herod have found any fault in him. Now I want to ask you. Have you ever thought about how many characters who surround the cross. Who affirm the innocence of Jesus. Three times in Luke's gospel, Pilate says, I find no fault in him. Pilate knew he was innocent. Herod knew he was innocent. Not only that, Pilate's wife knew he was innocent. In Matthew 27, in verse 19, Pilate's wife sent him a message and said, Have nothing to do with this righteous man, for last night I suffered much in a dream because of him. Pilate's wife knew he was innocent. Judas knew he was innocent. In Matthew 27, 3, he throws down the chain, the, the 30 pieces of silver, and says, I have sinned, I have betrayed innocent blood. The thief on the cross knew he was innocent. Do you not fear God since we're under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly? But this man has done nothing wrong. And the centurion knew he was innocent. In Luke 23 verse 47 what he says in Luke's account when Jesus dies certainly this man was innocent. All 
these characters affirm the innocence of Jesus. He is not on the cross for anything he has done, but for what we have done. Pilate knows this is a difficult situation politically. He wants to let Jesus go, but he knows he will face the wrath of the Jews. In Mark's account, the crowd initiates the practice or initiates the reminder. It's a custom to let a prisoner go to the people. And maybe this will be Pilate's out. As he offers the people a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. Now Mark 15, 7 tells us Barabbas had committed insurrection. Same kind of thing they accused Jesus of. And he had actually committed murder in the insurrection. And he offers them a choice. Jesus or Barabbas. And the crowd shout, Barabbas, Barabbas. And he said, what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? The crowd shout to Pilate, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. And Pilate says, why? What evil has he done? And that question is not answered by the crowds. But they continue to shout, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. It's interesting that in the Gospels, before the feast, they feared a riot if they did arrest and crucify Jesus. But now Pilate fears a riot if he doesn't crucify Jesus. But he takes water and washes his hands in front of the crowd and says, I am innocent of this man's blood. You see to that yourselves. And they shout, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And Jesus is sentenced to crucifixion. Crucifixion was one of the worst forms of capital punishment our world has ever seen. It was intentionally designed to prolong the suffering and agony of the victim to the highest degree. And this is how Jesus died. To die by crucifixion was to die a physically painful death, and it was to die a shameful death. One thing the text tells us is that Jesus was scourged before he was crucified. Now, it may have been that Jesus was scourged even before the sentence, the final sentence of death was pronounced. John's gospel makes it look that way. As Jesus is scourged and he's brought to the crowds and Pilate says, Behold the man, maybe thinking that they will be sympathetic toward this one who has suffered so much. But scourging was a horrible punishment as a person was beaten repeatedly across their back. And Josephus said he saw people beaten till their bones and internal organs were visible. And they died under scourging alone. There have been many movies made about Jesus. Some of them did okay. Some of them not very well. But I always stated that there would never be a movie about Jesus that portrayed scourging in all of its horror. Because no No one could bear to watch. There was one that came close. And I could not bear to watch. To die on the cross was to die a death, a physical pain. It was to die a death of social stigma. From the Roman standpoint, they were regarding someone as trash, as not fit to live. And they, ext- they reserved crucifixion uh, among their own citizens for the most extreme cases of treason. As one lawyer argued, far be the cross from the back and the mind of any Roman citizen. So when the Romans crucified Jews, they were labeling them as trash and not fit to live. And from a Jewish perspective... To see one dying on a tree meant to die under the curse of God in Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. Now that context is not talking about crucifixion. It's talking about someone who's executed and their bodies hung up after death. 
But the Jews made that connection. Some of the Dead Sea Scrolls show they made the connection between crucifixion and death upon a tree. Jesus died on the cross, a shameful way for a Jewish person to die. Paul said we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are saved, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Don't you imagine if your worst enemy were to die this way? You would think, I could not bear to watch. I I feel sympathy for them. But the crowds continued to taunt this dying man. He saved others. He can't save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. And we will believe in him. They continue to taunt him. And yet he prays. Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Jesus cries out. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only statement on the cross from Matthew and Mark. Some misunderstand the cry as crying for Elijah. Some bring him wine to put it upon his lips. And others say, if, if, let's see if Elijah will come to save him. But he cries again and gives up the spirit. And when he gives up the, when he dies, the Bible says the earth begins to shake and rocks split. And the, and the curtain between the holy and most holy place is torn in two from top to bottom. And the centurion observes all this. He said, in Luke's account, certainly this man was innocent. In Matthew's account, he and those with him said, this was the Son of God. Let me encourage you to read the text Because the text of the Bible is better than my telling of the text. Read the text. But let me stop here and make a couple of points. What do we see via the cross of Christ? One thing we see via the cross of Christ is we see how horrible how hideous, how ugly sin is. We see that in the cross. And there are ugly pictures of sin in the Bible. There are pictures that are intentionally ugly about sin in the Bible. If you do not know Ezekiel 13 and Ezekiel 23, you may be shocked at some of their language. As immoral as, as the harlot who spreads her legs to everyone who passes by is used as a description of God's people who have sinned, of Israel who has sinned. In 2 Peter 2, the Bible talks about the sow returning to uh, its washing in the, or wallowing in the mire and the dog returning to its vomit. Those are ugly pictures. But maybe none of them this ugly. If you were to vote among yourselves and to select who you believe to be the most innocent, the most innocent soul among you, and to bring them before us and subject them to the same kind of treatment that Jesus was subjected to, the scourging, the crucifixion, we would either, if we were too weak, bury our heads in disgust, or if we were strong enough, mount a rebellion. We could not bear to watch. And yet the God who spoke the worlds into existence, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, the one who is 
As we studied today in John 11, the resurrection and the life subjected himself to death. Sometime in life, you're going to be tempted to do something that you know is wrong. You know it's wrong. And the temptation is strong anyway. What can keep you from sin? Looking at the cross. And let it show you how ugly sin is. But from a positive standpoint, the cross shows us how deep his love is too. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. 1 John 3, 16, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, we could fill this page up with verses from the New Testament that attach the love of God to the cross of Christ. As Jack Cottrell said, it is difficult to find a New Testament verse about the love of God that doesn't mention the cross of Christ because the cross is the preeminent display of God's love. It is the ultimate display. Some would die for a good man or a righteous man, but God demonstrates his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. Christ offered himself for us and became a sweet savor to God. We could go on and on and on. The love of God is demonstrated most powerfully in the cross of Christ. I love the Old Testament statement. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, full of long-suffering, abounding in loving kindness, uh, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sins, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. If you just take the Old Testament and you study all the demonstrations of God's loving kindness and faithfulness, God's mercy and grace, that is overwhelming. And yet it is so overwhelming. And John 1 says, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1, 17. That is not to say there is no grace in the Old Testament. That is to say that the preeminent display of grace is so bright that it makes all those displays in the Old Testament. It far surpasses them. Social workers came to a third world country As soon as they arrived, they found a little girl desperately in need of a blood transfusion. They found the girl. They quickly explained in the language of the native people to those who were present that this girl needed a transfusion or she was going to die. They asked, would any of you volunteer? And there was a little boy about her age, about five, who raised his hand nervously and said he would give blood. As they laid him down and went through all the preparation and then began to draw the blood from his arm, they saw that he kept crying long after the pain should have ceased. And they tried to ask him, what is wrong? What, what's the problem? He explained back to them that he was crying because he understood their words to be that in giving blood for this girl that he would die in the process. And they assured him, no, you're going to be fine. But that left them with another question. Why would you give blood for her? 
thinking you were going to die in the process. And he said, because she is my friend. And this article finished with the words of John 15, 13. No greater love as a man than this, but to lay down his life for his friend. Whether it be you who are younger, for those of us middle age and older, when the Lord tells us something that doesn't seem easy, that seems to run counter to our nature, always be assured He loves you. God loves you and wants you to go to heaven more than you want that for yourself. And more than we as parents want that for our children. Because God being infinite, His love is infinite. And He longs for us to be with Him. But we can't leave Jesus in the grave. Joseph of Arimathea had been in the closet. He'd been a secret disciple. But he sees all that's happened and he's outraged. He was a member of the council. And he takes the bold act to go in before Pilate and to beg for the body of Jesus. Pilate is surprised that Jesus is dead already. But he grants to Pilate, he grants to Joseph the body of Jesus. And Joseph, along with Nicodemus from the Gospel of John, we find they both bury Jesus Together, they anoint his body. The women are also there anointing the body of Jesus. But, but they are very quick. They're acting quickly because the Sabbath is hurrying. They must leave and come finish this task another day. But the women are very careful to know exactly which tomb it is because they know they're going to have to make a return trip. They seem to have no thought of what's going to happen. While the enemies have thought about it, the enemies have come to Pilate in Matthew 27, 62 through 66 and said, remember that while the deceiver was alive, he said after three days he would rise again. Pilate says you have a guard. Make it as secure as you know how. But they're not going to be able to keep this body in this grave. Death cannot keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior. He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. On the first day of the week, as the women are coming to the tomb, they find that the stone has been rolled away. They walk into the tomb, and they cannot find the body of Jesus. And suddenly angels appear, and they ask, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. They run back to tell the disciples, and their words seem as nonsense to them. And they would not believe in Luke 24, in verse 11. I'm glad they were reluctant to believe. I'm glad they needed overwhelming evidence. And I stand in awe of their willingness to die for him, knowing that none of it meant anything if Jesus wasn't raised. Oh, yes. Young people, if you doubt your faith, study the evidences for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Study it. Each time I look at it, I become more convinced that what I was taught by parents and my preachers when I was growing up are true. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The strength of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is, as Shane talked about in John 11, the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in him shall never die. While suffering and death come even to the friends of Jesus, a resurrection to life comes only to the friends of Jesus. This was told as a true story in Chicken Soup for the Christian Soul. A 
a handicapped boy. A handicapped boy was around 12. He was in a rural area. He was in a second grade. His teacher tried to be patient with him, but he was so distracting to the class. And the prospects of him learning anything were so small. She called his parents in one day and she said, we're not being fair to Jeremy. He needs to be in a special school. And his parents began to cry. His father explained there was no special school like that around. There was no special school. And that that so few things that Jeremy loved in life, and the school was one of them, and he hated to take that away from him. The teacher thought, well, I'm going to do better communicating with the parents. I'm going to tell them the responsibilities. I'm going to try to work with them. And he showed some improvement. It was the spring of the year. And the teacher came that day with a large plastic egg for each of her 19 students. And she handed them out and she says, now your assignment in this, at this po- point is to go home and to put something in the egg that represents new life. Things that were dead coming to life. And the children listened with excitement. This is fun homework. All except one. The teacher could tell by the blank stare on Jeremy's face that he didn't understand a word she said. And she made a mental note that she was going to call his parents when she got home. When she got home, there were a lot of tasks to do and she didn't call his parents. The next day, as it came time to open up the eggs, she would open up one and praise the student for what a good job they did. And the student would add a few comments. And she opens several. And then she opens one that is completely empty. And she knows instantly whose egg this was. And she knows it was her fault because she didn't call his parents. And so she just starts to put Jeremy's egg aside without saying anything, but he wasn't going to let it die. And he said, but teacher, you said nothing about my egg. And she disgustingly said, Jeremy, it's empty. And he said, and so was the tomb of Christ. She said, why was his tomb empty, Jeremy? And he said, evil men put him to death. But God raised him from the dead. The story went on to say that that summer, that that boy passed away. And each of his classmates brought their plastic egg that was empty on the inside and placed it upon his casket because the tomb of Jesus is empty. One day the tomb of all those who put their trust in Jesus will be empty. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Praise God. Amen.